Hello, everyone. It's Xiao. Hello, 大家好，这里是小帆船 and welcome to my second art vlog. Yay! And the topic today is going to be perspective and depth. Yay! Woot! Fanfare. <clears throat> Anyways, these are very important topics. They are one of the fundamentals of art, and in order to paint something. Convincingly, you need to be able to apply perspective and simulate depth in order for something on a two-dimensional surface to be able to read as a convincing three-dimensional space. Now there are two different types of perspectives. There's linear perspective and there's atmospheric perspective. I'm going to cover both of these at a very high level. There are many, many YouTubers and artists who have already covered these topics at length and in depth, and they've done a great job at doing so. So I'm going to only go through these at a very, very high level in order to give you an idea of what these things are, and then move into more of some of the tricks that I use to enhance the feeling of depth in my pieces. So first off, linear perspective. Is actually based on a school of mathematics, which is called descriptive geometry, and that's an area of study that's very important for engineers and architects. But from just an illustrator and a concept art perspective, it's important as a art fundamental only to the point of being able to apply it eloquently to your paintings. Otherwise, the actual calculations and so forth aren't、uh, that important. Although it's it's good to have things correct, it doesn't need to be down to the minuscule details. As long as it looks fine, it's it's good. The second type of perspective is atmospheric perspective. This is the idea where there's stuff in between you and the thing that you're looking at. So, depending on how much stuff there is between you and the subject, that further away subject is going to be number one less saturated in color, and also less detailed because you can't see as much of it. So, on a clear day, if you were looking at the opposite shore on a lake, you'd probably be able to see a lot of the trees, the colors of the leaves, maybe some rocks on the shore, etc. But On a stormy day or a foggy or misty day, you might be able to make out the outline of the opposite shore, but you wouldn't be able to see a lot of the details that are there. So that's what this is, and the combination of the two of the two is, is important in in expressing depth in your pieces. So I'm going to get into some of my perspective pieces. These are all just line art, and this is just stuff that I did in my first year in my perspectives course. This is one point perspective, probably the most simple application of perspective here. There is a horizon line, and there is one vanishing point, so one point perspective. This is two point perspective, where there is a horizon line, one point here. And another one off to the left somewhere over here. Three point perspective. The horizon line. One point here, another one out to the right, and another one up top.、Uh, and this sort of setup is good for expressing more dramatic shots to emphasize the height of buildings or the depth of canyons. And then this one, this last one, is my favorite type of perspective. It's five-point perspective and curvilinear perspective. And I think, in layman's terms, this is more commonly known as fisheye. And there are actually five points in this piece. So my horizon line here isn't straight; it's at a tilt, which is also known as Dutch. And there's one point here, one point off the page on the right, one in the middle. 
one up top here and one in the bottom here. And the reason I like this view is because it makes everything look kind of dreamlike and it can give, give you some pretty trippy looking effects in, in your paintings and drawings. So uh, kind of labor intensive to apply, but pretty cool if you can get it down right. And now I'm going to move into some of the atmospheric perspective applications. These are some paintings I did in 2019, which, yes, I do kind of cringe at now, but they kind of prove my point here. So if we look at the top, this is a painting of Huangshan, which is a mountain range in China. Uh, you can see that the closer mountains have more texture on them uh, in the rocks and the sides of the cliffs. And then as you go further away, the mountains get lighter, they get less saturated, and this last row here basically has no details on them at all, except for the silhouette. And then this bottom painting here, same deal. This area here has a lot more texture and detail than the mountain range in the middle here. And of course, there's also less details on the shadow side, but that's a different topic. I will cover that in some other vlog video. So now we've covered everything, the basics of perspective. I'm going to get into more of depth and how to further enhance the feeling of depth. A uh, quick disclaimer here, though. If you don't apply perspective correctly, None of these tricks that I'm going to cover next are going to save your piece. These need to be applied on top of the correct application of perspective. Period. No ifs, ands, ors, or buts. That's just how it's going to work. And to do this dive into depth, I'm going to look at one of my favorite cinematographers, Zhang Yimou, and just looking at these screenshots, I think you can kind of tell that this person has had a profound impact on, on my art. <laughs> and here we can see screenshots from four different movies. There's this one here and this one are from Hero. The one in the middle here is from House of Flying Daggers. These two here on the right are from Curse of the Golden Flower. And the one on the bottom here is Shadow. Now, composition and color aside, which this cinematographer does absolutely incredibly, I'm going to just focus on this one thing that isn't just unique to this one director, but a lot of well, all films, really, is this concept called depth of field. And depth of field is this thing where only items a certain distance away from you or the camera lens are in focus. And everything outside of that range is blurred or out of focus. And so if we zoom in here, this first screenshot, the tree here in the foreground beautifully frames the two characters here, but at the same time, it's completely out of focus, which gives you a great sense of depth and also helps you focus on the two main characters in the action. The second one, the bamboo in the front and the bamboo in the background are all out of focus. This last one here focuses on Jet Li and everything in the front and everything in the back gets gradually more and more out of focus. And in this scene, the door frame, the background here is also out of focus. In this one, the candle holder and the back of the room are out of focus. And in this one here, the bamboo is out of focus and the bamboo in the background is also out of focus. So that's something that can be applied also to our paintings because 2D paintings don't have a lens and there's no natural depth of field that can be applied. This needs to be added purposefully to our paintings. 
So if you look at some paintings that I did in 2020, and you've probably seen these if you watched my previous video, but I'm going to go through them again. For this first one, there's this gigantic tree branch that's reaching towards the camera, quote, quote, camera. And it's completely out of focus. It's completely blurred out. At the same time, a lot of the details out here on the edge of the painting is also out of focus. And everything's very blurry and mushed together. Which helps you focus on the two characters in the middle of the painting here. The second painting down here, there's screens on either side of the characters. And these are also blurred, out of focus. The background here, the window is out of focus. And even the middle ground here, with the candles and the other screens on the other side of the room, are actually also out of focus, just not as blurry as the windows on the wall in the back. And some more examples of my own paintings from 2020. Up here we see that the roof eaves are out of focus. And then down in this painting here, all the branches and leaves and grass in the front here are out of focus. As well as the foliage out here, there's barely any details at all. That's all out of focus, as well as here in the top left corner. Okay, so that said, I'm going to do a very quick demo again and show you some of the tools I use. First, I'm going to zoom out some more because I work really small. Okay. So the first thing here is to define where your horizon line is. And the general rule of thumb is to put it either on the top third or on the bottom third of the page. Because if you were to put it in the middle, it creates this very static look. It perfectly divides your canvas in half, and it doesn't direct the viewer's eyes into ne either the top portion or the bottom portion. And it just normally does not work. So I'm going to put my horizon line in the top third. And I'm going to add one vanishing point. So the way I do vanishing points is by using this polygon tool down here. If you go, it's usually the rectangle tool, and the shortcut is U. But if you right click on it, and you pull up the polygon tool, normally what happens is this star button or box is not clicked, and you would create a polygon of the number of sides that are defined in this box here. And because I've defined 99 sides, it basically just looks like a circle. But if you go into settings and you click star, it will create a star with 99 points. So if I do this, it creates a perfect vanishing point. I'm going to turn down the opacity on that. Create a new layer under it. And start painting. So for this demo, I'm going to do a, a tree. Why do you like painting trees? Because because they're forgiving. Uh, usually organic shapes are a lot more forgiving than architecture. They bend into interesting shapes. They're not rigid. They're not straight. So it's, it's a lot easier to draw organic shapes in perspective than it is to draw buildings. Because if you're off by one straight line in a building, it will make your entire drawing look weird. So here what I'm gonna do is draw one of those trees that sort of bend into the distance on, on mountains. If you've ever seen photos of Chinese mountain ranges, you'll see these really cool looking pine trees that sort of grow sideways out of cliff sides. And they look like they're almost bowing at you as if to say hi, or to greet you, or to say goodbye, uh, however you interpret it. So this is the type of feel that I'm trying to go for here. So imagine that 
you, the viewer, or me, were standing on the mountainside or the cliffside, looking out at this branch or this tree that's growing into the distance. And the background is just mountain mist. My sketches are usually pretty messy. I don't really use line art, so I'm not too concerned in terms of cleaning things up when I paint. Simply because, well, I, I don't need it in the end, I'm gonna paint over it. But if you do use line art, uh, I mean, you can always add another layer and go over it to clean it up. And even in my webtoon, I don't use line art in the backgrounds, they're just straight painted, so I don't even need to clean it up there, even though my characters have line art on them. Okay, so that's my tree branch going out into the distance. I'm going to add some more leaves and foliage and some grass here, just to express the ledge maybe we're taking this picture from. So there's my simple tree branch. I'm gonna add a layer underneath, pick my color, and we'll go with the sky color here. Draw my airbrush. Fill this in. Okay, now I'm gonna define my light source. Go up here. I like to use a warm light, but I mean, you don't have to. It's just my preference. So I'm going to add some yellow up here to the top. So my light source is more or less coming from the top right corner. I'm going to do my tree branch. I'm going to go for kind of a purpley color. Now again, remembering atmospheric perspective, I'm going to make this purpley color fade out to more of this blue color in the background the further away it gets from me. Then I'm going to add some greens. And in order to paint leaves, it's actually easier to think of them as giant chunks of one cohesive clump instead of singular leaves. Because from far, far away, Clusters of leaves are just that, they're chunks. And each chunk has an underside and, and a top side. And so if you think about it that way, it's a lot easier to render out leaves as opposed to every single one of them. So if you think about this mushroom shape with a dome on top and sort of a bottom like this, it's a lot easier. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm defining the bottom of the clusters of leaves and then the top side, 
I'm going to go into more of a yellow color for the leaves that pick up the light, sunlight here. And I don't like the color. It's a little bit too yellowy. Yeah, that works. And then in the middle, the area of gradient between the shadows and the highlights usually is the area of the strongest local color. Um, sort of from my observations. So I'm going to add a little bit more of a more saturated green in here. Okay, add a little bit more dark to edge of the tree that's closest to us and a little bit more saturation. Oops. Okay, I'm going to pick up this orangey color again and put some highlights on this tree branch. And again, I use the eyedropper tool a lot. I just don't want to mix colors too much. Okay. So that kind of defines my tree branch going into the distance here. And then on top of those layers, I'm going to add another one and paint in my really, really close up foreground elements, like these grasses and these leaves. Okay, so now that I've defined the shapes and the form and the general lighting structure, I'm going to go back to my line art, decrease the opacity, and merge down. And go to the lasso tool and pick out the tree branch to put it onto a separate layer. So you can select it actually in, in steps. If you hold down the shift key while you're using the lasso tool, you can add to the current selection. And if you hold the alt key, it will subtract from the current selection. Okay, and then I just control C, control V, paste that onto a separate layer, lock the layer, go back to my background, and use my airbrush to paint away the traces of the tree and any of the leftover line art that I don't want. Okay, and I don't really need the perspective grid anymore, so I'm going to hide that layer. And well, it looks like there's a bit missing from the tree, so let's add that back in. Okay, lock layers again. And paint away any traces of the line art here. I'm going to go to my hard round brush. Now I'm going to stick with a hard round brush here and 
not go into any details on the textures for this tutorial because I've already covered it in my first art vlog and it'll take me longer if I were to texture this thing. So I'm gonna leave a link to my previous art vlog and you can see how textures are applied there. For this one, I'm just gonna use the hard round brush. The key thing to remember in your shadows is that there's always, or there's usually going to be ambient or bounce light. So that just means that the main light source will shine light on everything in its path. And then when it hits the background, it's going to bounce back and hit the other side of whatever subject you're painting. So these clumps of leaves on the underside will show traces of bounce light, which theoretically should be kind of a bluish color because that's the color of the background. And again, I will probably cover color and light in a different video. I'm just going to leave it at that for this one. So I want, oops, I want the leaves on this last branch to be slightly further away. And in order for me to do that, I'm going to add some more atmospheric perspective into the picture here and just fade it out a little bit more. So that's basically the color of my branch. Now I'm going to play with the curves a little bit to see if I can punch out the light even more. And the classical curves application is the S curve, which is often used in photo editing. And that is to punch up the brights and to make the darkers a little bit darker. I think that's good. Okay, uh, there's still some traces of line art here. I'm also going to clean up the foreground a little bit with my hard round brush. And my eraser tool. Sometimes you can use the eraser with the hard round brush tip to achieve the clean edges that you want.
Another good thing to do is also have some overlap. That way things are in front of another one and so emphasizes depth even more. The only part with this is to be careful with the values. Like here, the value between the tree trunk and the leaves in the front are too close to each other, so they're kind of losing, or I'm losing the leaves into the tree trunk. So I'm going to turn the curves down and to make that a little bit darker. Okay, there. So go back to this layer, clean up the lines a little bit more. Oops. Clean up some of this. Okay, so now comes the actual blurring part. Oh wait, there's a little bit more here. Photoshop has this really cool tool called Field Blur. So go to Filter, go to Blur Gallery, and then click Field Blur. And this thing will help to simulate what something would look like if it were shot with an actual film camera. So you can take a point here, and let's say I want the camera to be focused on the tree branches out in the middle of the composition. I can add another point here, turn the blur to zero, and that will be in focus. And I want this part of the trunk that's closest to me to be out of focus. I can turn up the blur and just blur this part of the painting. Make sure this part's also not blurred. And click enter. Whoops. And you'll see that difference there if I just undo it. No blur, and then that's with blur. Okay. And then this foreground element, because it's even closer to us, it should theoretically be even more blurry. So go again to field blur. Turn it up. Apply that. And just to make this more interesting, I'm going to make this side closer to me. And I'll make that bigger. And there you go. So with the blur, you can see that the part of the trunk that's closest to us is blurred out and it simulates the effect of having the field of depth applied from a film camera. But again, if you didn't apply perspective correctly and this tree trunk is not illustrated to conform to this perspective grid, this application of the blur is not going to work. It's just going to look really weird. So again, perspective is really important in applying any of the tricks that I've mentioned. And uh, hopefully this tutorial was helpful for you, and hopefully it'll lessen your struggle. And thank you for watching. Until next time.